Hello and welcome to Valonia United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Lauren Delano and it is such a joy to be worshiping alongside you today as we gather together to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and to give thanks for the love of God that is unending and never fails. I want to give thanks to all of those who have participated in worship and helped to make worship possible today. Thank you to our lay readers, Dorit Caulfield and the Carson family. And I want to give thanks for those who offer their musical gifts and lead us in music today during worship. Jeremy Carson, David Yarbrough, and John Dale and David Nichols. As we begin worship, I hope that you will take some time to fill out the virtual attendance pad. It's in the details section on YouTube and Facebook. You can let us know that you're worshiping with us there and also let us know if you have any prayer requests. I would love to be in prayer for you over the next week if you would let us know about your joys and concerns. As we begin worship this morning with a prayer and then our first hymn, I want to remind you that God meets you where you are. Whether you've been worshiping with Valonia United Methodist for a few minutes or a few weeks, or you've been a part of this congregation for many years, God welcomes you here. You're invited to come as you are because God opens his arms and welcomes you as a child of God. So let us worship together. As we come together for worship, let us pray. Creator God, we give you thanks that you are a God of abundant and extravagant grace. Through Jesus' teachings and parables, we are reminded again and again that you do not desert us or leave us even when we sin against you. You always welcome us back into your fold as a shepherd welcomes his sheep, reminding us that even we fall, your love remains. Today we celebrate your love and we ask that it would grow in our hearts so that others might experience your love. For we know so many are in need of your healing and care. We ask that you might offer comfort to those seeking your guidance. We lift up those who are grieving the loss of a loved one or who are experiencing loss of other kinds. We pray for those around us who need your care and ask that you would make of us your instruments of healing, peace, and redemption. Help us to trust in you, especially in times of uncertainty like we are experiencing during this pandemic and give us your eyes to see how we can be your church to one another and to all of our neighbors this day. And now let us join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. 
Our scripture reading today is the parable of the prodigal son from Luke chapter 15. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and, grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property so that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and traveled into a distant country. And there he squandered his property with dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He himself would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and but no one gave him anything. But then he came to himself and said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare? And here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatty calf and killed it. And let us celebrate and eat. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He came and he called one of the slaves and asked him what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed a fattest and fatted calf because he had gotten him back safe and sound. 
Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered to his father, Listen, for all these years I had been working for you. I am working like a slave for you. And I, and I never disobeyed, and you commanded, and uh, your command. Yet you have never given me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when your son, when this son of yours came back, who who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then his father said to him, "Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours." But we have to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours had, was dead and he has come back to life. He was lost and now he's found. Um, this is the word of the Lord, a uh, word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jonathan and Patty, for reading our scripture passage for today as we learn about God's grace and how we are called to celebrate that grace in our series that we're continuing today, First Things First. As our passage begins today, in the first few verses of Luke chapter 15, we catch a glimpse of Jesus offering a lesson to the Pharisees and scribes. They're the religious leaders tasked with teaching others about God and demonstrating the laws of God and how to love God well. And yet Jesus is critical of them for a moment. Through the telling of three parables, he asked them to imagine how God's mercy might be bigger than they understand it to be. He asked them to picture God's table being wider than the one that they often gather at. Jesus often uses parables as teaching devices, as a way to offer people a different perspective, a new way of seeing the world through Christ's eyes. The parables in Luke chapter 15 have a theme about them of losing and finding. One about a lost sheep that is found. One about a lost coin that a woman looks for everywhere. And finally, a story about a lost son, sometimes called the prodigal son. And while he returns on his own, the other theme of all three of these passages is that there is a celebration at the end. When the lost is found, when the lost returns. And so we're going to look at the prodigal son story today and see what this celebration is all about. Our interpretations of well-known Bible stories is often influenced by the section titles in our Bibles. These titles keep up with the movement of the stories from one chapter to the next or one narrative to the next. And often these titles tell us which character, character will star in the particular story or what lesson we might learn from the story. This section is often titled the prodigal son or the lost son. And often as we hear those words, we assume that it's the younger son who is lost or prodigal. For prodigal means to be wastefully extravagant, to spend money or resources freely and recklessly. We see that the younger son fulfills the characteristics of this definition immediately. He goes to the father asking for half of his father's inheritance. Something he would have received when his father passed away normally. Yet he doesn't want to wait until then. He wants the money right now. We don't know what leads the son to make this request, why he wants to leave the place he's known his whole life. Most likely the place his family has lived for generations. But he chooses to leave the people who know him and love him most. And he decides he wants to journey off to a distant country, and he, there he spends all that his father gave him. In this foreign place, he's now living without money or work. He begins to experience famine along with others in this place. Since he has no money, no food, no place to go, he finds a job working as a swineherd. A job that would have been unheard of in his hometown since pigs were considered unclean to the Jewish people. We feel for him when we read this story. We hear him make mistake after mistake, thinking, why did he choose this path? And yet as we think that, we don't want to identify with the younger son ourselves. We don't want to think about when we've been like him. It's easy for us to see his mistakes, but to look back on our own is painful. 
Of course, we know what it's like to squander the gifts of God. We know what it's like to be lost, unable to find our way to where God is calling us. And yet we are often slow to admit that we feel distant from God. And when we do that, it's often due to our own greed or our own arrogance or self-reliance. For it's so easy for us to think we know the best path to take. We know the way we should go. We know how to handle things on our own, just like the youngest son does. As he pines after food, any food, even that food which the pigs he is feeding have to fill their bellies, he comes to realize that he has a place to return to. That his father's home is a place he can go back. Sure, he may have to work as a servant. Sure, his father may not be very happy with him for picking up and leaving in the first place. But there is a place that he belongs. Though he was once lost, he has come to his senses and realized it's up to him to be found. And so this lost son heads home. As I mentioned, our focus in this parable is often on the younger son, but I want to invite us to pay a little bit more attention to the older son today. Maybe some of you who are older siblings, like I am the oldest sibling, can relate to this older son. This one who wants his father to be just and fair, who wants his old, younger brother to have followed the rules. I want us to pay attention to this older brother and his reaction to his father's gracious response to his brother's return. As the younger son is still a long way up the road, the father runs to meet him. The father doesn't wait for the son to get home. Instead, he meets him where he is. The text tells us that the father was filled with compassion. He could not contain his love for his son, and so he had to go meet him on the road as he returned. As they make their way back to the property, I imagine the father is cooking up this great plan for celebration in his head. Because before the son even has much time to apologize for leaving, the father calls out to his servants to bring his son the best robe, a ring, sandals, seeking to clothe him in love and remind him that he is his son, that while he was gone, he was loved, and he continues to be in his return. Finally, the father asks for the fatted calf to be killed so they can eat and celebrate. And as the party is starting, the eldest son enters the scene. He comes in from a hard day's work in the field. And he hears a celebration going on without him. One that he didn't get the memo about. He wasn't invited to. It didn't make word out to the field that he would be returning to the celebration. As he calls one of his father's workers over, he asks to get the details. And it is clear that he is not happy about what he finds out. As the father comes to greet him, he lets his father know of his frustration. He's appalled that his father would welcome this younger son back so easily. That he would go to so much trouble to celebrate the son who had abandoned him. The older brother says in verses 29 and 30, Listen! For all these years, I've been working like a slave for you. I've never disobeyed your command. You have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him? In other words, this is not fair. What are you thinking? You've never honored me or cared for me like you care for him, for your son. The older brother, so caught up in what he hasn't received in that moment, forgets, misses out on remembering and giving thanks for the blessings his father has lavished upon him in the past. There are two things I want you to notice, to pay attention to in the older son's response. First of all, remember who Jesus is speaking to as he tells this story. His audience is the tax collectors and the scribes, the religious rule followers who are diligently seeking after God and yet don't understand why Jesus would hang out with people who are deemed sinners, including tax collectors. Jesus wants them to realize that they are acting like the older brother who thinks he's entitled to his father's unrelenting love and grace while his brother is not. If those listening to Jesus that day do not realize that God's love is bigger than the rules and regulations that they have set for who God is and how God works and who God loves, they're missing out on a big lesson about God's mercy and love being for all people, 
not just those who walk around thinking they are perfect and without blemish. Both brothers receive the Father's love. This love just comes to them in different ways, in different forms. Another interesting part of the older brother's response is the way he refers to his brother who has returned. When he is talking to his father, he doesn't say, when my brother returned, you threw a party. Instead, he says, when this son of yours returned. In this language of the son of yours, it seems that he is distancing himself from his younger brother, unable to name their relationship to one another. He's so angry and so unwilling, unwilling to reconcile with his brother that he cannot name their close connection as siblings. We have all done this before when we're frustrated with someone. Maybe as a parent, when your child has let you down, you relay the story to your spouse later by saying, do you know what your child did today? Not our son or our daughter, not my child, but your child putting the blame on someone else. When we are angry, unable to seek reconciliation with another person, we don't think of them as our sibling, our friend, as a part of our family. It's in those moments that we become lost, just like the older son. He missed out on an opportunity to offer prodigal grace and joy to his brother as he returned. He could have given love and grace extravagantly like his father. But he didn't have it in him because he wanted his father to be fair, not understanding, to be tough not merciful. What if the older brother, the older son, is really the prodigal or the lost? What if he's the wasteful, irresponsible one, the one lost in the midst of God offering love to someone else? While it's easy to find ourselves in the younger son sometimes to imagine the ways we've separated ourselves from God, we too can identify with the older brother who wants justice while withholding compassion in this sibling rivalry. And yet the father has such a gentle and loving response for both boys. He realizes that they are both lost and hurting. They are both in need of extravagant love and grace. Another definition for the word prodigal is having or giving something on a lavish scale. The father seems to have this prodigal way of life down as he offers a lavish celebration for the younger son his way of showing him love and care, but also as he offers a lavish response to his older son. He says to his older son when he's complaining, son, you are always with me. All that is mine is yours. What more of a reward could the older son ask for than this promise that all that the father has is his too? What is so beautiful about this passage is the reminder that even when we are prodigal in the negative sense, reckless, irresponsible, wasteful, our God is willing to be a prodigal God offering lavishness upon us, giving us lavish love and grace beyond all that we can imagine. God's response that of the Father in this story, this response, we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. And like the older brother figured out, this love, this celebration is not just for you or for me, it's for everyone. No matter their shortfalls, no matter how they've squandered their gifts of God, no matter how many times they or we have strayed from the path that we should be on. As the father stood outside the party that day to convince the older son to come join the fun, he reminded him, this is my house, and I'm going to welcome, rejoice, celebrate with whoever I choose to invite. It's not for us to decide who will experience God's great love. For God will offer this extravagant, party-throwing, running down the road to hug second and third and fourth chance love to whoever God wants to offer it to. And that will never change. This is the kind of God that I want to worship. One who celebrates transformation. One who says, I offered new life to you and you are invited to receive it. One who says that even when you fall short and you reject others, I'm going to remind you that you are called to love them. That you are called to celebrate them. So this day, let us go to the party. Let us invite others into the party. And let us celebrate that this party is about transformation, resurrection, new life. 
that is offered to all people. And may we be assured that God's mercy and love is bigger than any boundaries or rules that we try to create around who deserves God's love. For God's mercy has no edge, and God's love has no limit. This is the good news. Amen. Let us affirm our faith as it is written in the Old and New Testaments. Please join us in reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born, in the vir born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Friends, what a joy it continues to be to get to know you all as we worship together in my first month as your pastor. As we meet together for administrative meetings, as I serve alongside you, or as I join a small group that you're a part of, or as I sit on your porch for coffee. I do want to say that if you are comfortable with a physically distant porch visit, I would love to come visit you on your front porch or back porch or in your yard. If there are others that live near you, I'd love to meet a few people. I'm happy to come over for a morning conversation over coffee or even to chat in the evening on your porch or in your yard. You can contact me by email or call the church office and I would love to set up a time to meet with you in the coming days. 
I do hope that you will continue also to give of your tithes and offerings to the congregation. As we continue to do all of those things I listed before, serving our neighbors, gathering for small groups, preparing for children's and youth activities, we could not be able to do these things or to be in relationship with one another in these ministries without your financial help along with your prayers. The two easiest ways to give are by mailing a check or by giving online through PayPal. You can find the link in the details for worship this morning for PayPal on YouTube and Facebook. Finally, I do want to let you know that we have some exciting things in the works for children, tweens, and youth. Starting Sunday, August 2nd, we'll be offering a three-week session with videos, activities, and weekly Zoom calls called The Incredible Gifts of God. We'll be using the characters from the movie The Incredibles to think about the superpowers that this family of superheroes have. And then we'll use them to talk about how we have superpowers too, which are spiritual gifts given to us by God. Parents, please email the church office to let us know if your child wants to participate. We'll provide the activities and links to the videos and weekly Zoom calls. As we continue to worship together now, as we celebrate that God is with us even when we are apart, as we worship together, let us sing with joy and assurance our final song, Softly and Tenderly. forgiveness when we 
return and repent. That God meets us where we are, running to the road to say, I love you and I welcome you home. And that we are people called to cheer on our brothers and sisters in faith. Knowing that just as God gives us grace when we follow the wrong path or when we fall short, that God does that for everyone. And that at God's party, at God's celebration, at God's table, there is room for everyone. So today, find a way to celebrate God's love. Find a way to celebrate God's new life and redemption. Find a way to trust that God is calling you home. Let God meet you where you are and open the door for others this day. Amen.